Hello, everyone. I'm sorry for the last minute change of plans. Um, I'm trying to get out of here by about 1230. So if you were looking forward to seeing me during office hours or the advising hour today at CGS, please just um, send me an email, let me know, and we'll find a time to get together. Or maybe I can try to answer your question over email, or you can give me a phone call and we will figure things out. But we're gonna talk about body composition today. First, I have a few announcements. The first being very exciting and important and in lieu of a joke today. I, as of yesterday at 2 p.m., have a new nephew. His name is Joshua Matthew. He's eight pounds, two ounces, 20 and a half inches long. And in my humble opinion, the cutest nephew on the whole earth. Oh, that was very exciting. Um, and our family is thrilled. This is the third for my sister, which means I'm definitely off the hook for a while because now there are two granddaughters and one uh, grandson on uh, our side of the family. So very exciting. Uh, looking forward to seeing him. Hopefully in the summer will be the first time I get to meet him. They live in England, but everyone's happy and healthy. And that is the fun, sweet um, maybe kind of funny thing for today. Other announcements for lab on Friday, you need to wear shorts and a tank top or some sort of loose fitting shirt so that we can get at your upper arm um, and gentlemen at your upper chest. <clears throat> Excuse me, and I apologize if that was really loud. Um, and please bring your tape measures to lab. Otherwise, we'll have all of the other supplies that you'll need. Next Wednesday, a week from today, you have an exam. It will be over skeletal muscle, the endocrine system, body composition, that's today, and environmental factors. That's going to be on Monday. So I highly recommend studying those first three bullets this weekend. Uh, and then all you need to do is review the lecture from Monday and the reading, and you'll be ready to go for Wednesday. So environmental factors should be nice and fresh in your brain. It's nothing too dense. Um, it's some more um, informative, pull it all together type of information than new um, complicated stuff. On Wednesday the 25th, as I said before, your lecture will be online just like this. Um, please go home for Thanksgiving, see your mother, see your fathers, see your siblings, and be nice. Don't forget to help with the dishes. Um, you do not need to post discussion questions for that day. So I will be decreasing the number of required discussion questions. It just won't work out logistically. I won't get a chance to answer them. If you have some sort of burning question, that you're just dying to ask, um, feel free to send that to me and I will do my very best to make sure your questions get answered about the physical activity guidelines. And you have no excuses for not doing that reading. It's very short. There are two really short articles and the the guidelines in particular are, are pretty informative. So please do that. Uh, and otherwise, the next time you'll see me is on Monday. So. All right, here we go with body composition. This goes back largely to insurance, mostly health, health insurance and life insurance. So for life insurance, actuaries, those are statisticians like on steroids who try and predict things and what's going to happen. And these actuarial tables used height and ratio of height to weight to try and look at what is somebody's health risk? So if you're getting life insurance, they wanna know, well, how soon are you gonna die? How soon do we have to start paying out versus how long are you gonna be paying in? So way back, they looked at the height of a person versus their weight and they saw trends. So the more somebody weighed for their height, the more likely they were going to have an increased health risk, in particular, if they were in the obese or the moderately to morbidly obese category. That's the red and the purple lines here. And you can see diabetes, gallstones, hypertension, arthritis for the big ones, your high risk for stroke, higher risk for heart disease. So uh, really these are probably more likely to kill you 
these are likely to ca cause um, health insurance companies to end up paying out a lot of money. This was the first big attempt to try and tie health to weight. The problem with using these tables today is that they uh, don't take into account body frame. All of this data was established based on white people. The mortality data is quite old. It's from the 50s and 60s. And it cannot be used to predict body composition. It's just standard height versus weight. So then we got a little bit more sophisticated and we started using BMI. So that is moderately correlated with body composition, meaning that if you did your body composition assessment and you compared it to your BMI, it would likely be pretty close. So remember, like we talked about before, just because something, uh, just because something is a prediction doesn't mean it's not any good. So remember, this is going to look like this if you have, no, is this not going to let me draw? Hang on, I'm trying to draw something for you. No, it's not going to let me draw. So if you have a chart that is, you know, a plain old X versus Y, I really would like to be able to draw. Oh, well. If you have a plain old X versus Y, you know, line that's kind of a one-to-one -one relationship, it's just a straight diagonal line, that would be a perfect relationship. Remember that if you have something that's a prediction equation, it's pretty close to that line. If it wasn't, we wouldn't use it at all. So just remember that just because it's a prediction doesn't mean it's totally useless. Uh, it just means that um, it is not a perfect estimation. Um, excuse the mouse. So BMI is actually correlated with body composition. It's where you're going to take your body mass in kilograms and divide it by your stature in meters squared. Again, similar to the height weight tables, these are correlated with health indicators. So same thing kind of as before, heart disease, stroke, hypertension, diabetes, all the things that are either going to cost money or make you die earlier. The limitations and application here is that age, gender, race, I have age on there again, I guess, because it's very important, um, aren't taken into account. So it doesn't matter if you are 12 or if you are 92, it will use the same equation. Um, it uses the same equation for women, um, though the cut points are different. It doesn't take into account factors affecting weight. The big one that we like to talk about, talk about is how much muscle somebody has. And it also doesn't take into account fat distribution. So, okay, you're overweight, but where is that extra weight? So we want to know where's the extra weight and what uh, what is making up that extra weight. Things really start getting real when we come up with the reference man and the reference woman. And what they did was they took a whole bunch of people, a bunch of men, a bunch of women, 20 to 24 years old. The reference man is 174 centimeters, so that makes him about five foot eight and a half. No, 62 inches is, okay, it makes him 68.5 inches. You guys can do the math. And he's going to weigh about 70 kilos, so total body mass, 70 kilos. Then reference woman is about 10, 10 centimeters shorter or four inches shorter. She's the same age, and she weighs, I've seen this 56.7 kilo number before. I've also seen that they just round it up to 60. So reference woman is about 60 kilos. Reference man is about 70 kilos. Remember to get pounds from kilos multiplied by 2.205. And they looked at their body composition. Um, some of this comes from they actually... Uh, used cadaver models and could literally break the whole body down and look at where everything was, but they also used some of the other methods that we're going to talk about in just a moment. Um, but they looked at what is making up the weight of the body. So lean body mass, that's going to be made up of muscle and bone. And then the body fat is going to be your 
total fat that's made up of your storage fat so kind of your adipose tissue that you can squeeze and jiggle and your essential fat your essential fat we're talking about the uh, fat that's surrounding your heart lungs liver spleen kidneys intestines muscles the cns tissue bone marrow all the other tissues in your body that use fat or are composed of fat that's your essential fat your storage fat is going to be your energy reserve your visceral fat to protect your internal organs and that storage fat uh, ends up being about 83 percent fat two percent protein and 15 percent water so remember when you lose weight you also lose water and that's one of the reasons that it looks like you lose a lot of weight at the very beginning of a, a program so the different models other than dividing the body into fat and not fat that's the two compartment model the two compartment model is that you're either fat free or fat so how much you use fat how much you use fat free doesn't matter if it's storage or essential doesn't matter if it's bone or muscle so on for the three compartment model they're going to break you down into water your total body water body protein and body fat so that piece is missing the bone component of fat freeness the only fat free you're getting there is water and protein the four compartment model you have body water body protein bone mineral and fat so the four compartment model is going to be the most accurate because it's going to really break everything down and that's sort of pictured here where you do actually have muscle bone and fat uh, what they don't have here is total body water and body water is one of the things that's going to vary a lot from from day to day the reason that the reference man and reference woman are important is because when you start using some of these equations that you're going to do in lab on Friday, um, it just takes into account the fact that a male is overall going to be taller and heavier. The skeleton is going to weigh more because their bones are more dense. They have a larger muscle mass and lower body fat content than females. So it's really getting at the fact that you can't use the same equations for men and women. One of the ways that we measure um, body composition, um, this is one of the gold standard. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm looking at the picture um, and talking about the wrong thing. So um, we have a lot of techniques for measuring body composition. The only way to directly measure body composition, the only way to directly measure body composition is to kill you, to dissect you, melt all of your fat down, separate out all of your bones, take off all of your skin, uh, get separate out all the fat from your organs and such. That is the only way to directly measure body composition. That's the only way we for sure know what your body composition is. That has been done. They didn't kill anyone, but they used cadavers and they literally melted them down into their component pieces. Uh, and that's what a lot of these equations are based on indirect measures meaning we don't have to kill you pictured here is hydrostatic weighing or underwater weighing this is still considered the gold standard um, though DEXA is also now considered a gold standard though that may be a controversial statement um, you can use anthropometric measures so that would be like the um, BMI um, or girth measurements you can use x-ray um, that's often used to look at frame size and um, adjust formulas for body composition mri and ct allows you to see what a layer of fat around a body section looks like and bia is your bioelectrical impedance analysis near infrared measures the distance from the skin to the muscle in a segment and uses that Ultrasound has, is a similar um, technique to near infrared. We can talk about DEXA and plasmography. We'll talk about um, each of these individually uh, in just a minute here. 
So I said hydrostatic weighing is the, the gold standard. Um, that along with plasmography um, use body density to figure out what the body composition is. So it's all about density because the, the reason that this is a crown here is because if you can remember Archimedes' principle that uh, the amount of water displaced is equal to the volume of the uh, of the, the volume of the water displaced is equal to the volume of the object, and you can get the object's density and mass divided by volume um, from doing a displacement um, calculation. So you put an object in water, um, you can either measure how much water that displaces or you can measure the change in its weight and the, the loss, um, the, um, the amount of loss of weight between the air and in the water uh, can be used to calculate density of, a, um, of an object. Just the easiest way to remember it is that, remember, the more dense something is, the more it's going to weigh when it's underwater. So um, that's why rocks sink and foam floats. No matter what Monty Python says, tiny rocks do not float. Now here's underwater weighing or hydrostatic weighing. What somebody would do is you can kind of see this guy on the left is taking a really deep breath in. He's sitting in a chair that's suspended from a scale. He's in a tank of water that's a specific temperature, and he's going to breathe in and then blow out all of his air that he possibly can. He's going to duck his head under the water, which you can see back in this image. So he's totally under the water, or she. Looks like she maybe has a bikini top on, but they're totally under the water, and they're going to weigh how much does that person weigh under the water. It also takes in, when you do the density equation, it also takes into account um, residual lung volume uh, and that can be measured with the um, with that um, digital spirometer that you guys used back in the pulmonary lab. But once you calculate body density, um, you uh, use that density measure in this equation, which is called the Siri equation. So you use 495 divided by your density minus 450. Um, this is a measurement of the constant density of tissues. Um, it has also been, you can also use 437.4 um, as divided by density in that equation. Um, that's another group's interpretation when they compared actual measurements of cadavers to underwater weighing. Um, and for people of African Car Caribbean descent, or basically black people, um, you use 392.8. So there are some differences between races um, that you can use. You do have to use a temperature correction for water density. So cold water and hot water have different densities. Um, you, again, have to subtract residual lung volume from the person's um, weight. And this is also still going to assume a two compartment model. The only thing you're gonna know is fat versus not fat. The other assumption is that it's a constant density of each component. So that's saying that the protein in your skin weighs the same as the pro is as dense as the protein in your muscle and your um, bone density is similar to your um, muscle and your skin, other non-fat components. So that's hydrostatic weighing or underwater weighing. It's been around for a long time and it's still usually the comparison um, when it comes to determining how well another technique can measure body composition. Plasmography, you may have heard of the bod pod. So this is the bod pod. It looks kind of like a spaceship. The person sits in here with as little clothing on as possible and with their hair um, all covered up uh, with a swimming cap. And basically this um, unit gets sealed shut and it measures um, body volume by measuring air displacement. So it knows how much air can go into that chamber up to a certain pressure when there's no one in it, how much air can go into that chamber when you're in it or when a person is in it. 
uh, that will give you the volume and body mass divided by body volume is going to give you um, their body density and you plug it into the same equations as the hydrostatic weighing back here. You still use that for your density number. Skin folds are one you're probably familiar with. The skin folds depends upon uh, an equation that says there's a relationship between the amount of subcutaneous fat you have uh, and the internal fat and your whole body density. So basically you uh, use these calipers. There are very nice instructions both in your lab and in your book as to how to perform skin fold assessments, but you can use some of a few different sites. Sometimes there are one site equations, there's some of three sites, there's some of seven sites. The more sites you do, uh, the more likely it is that um, it's closer to your actual um, body composition. So this is often used for pre and post assessments. It's used in, um, in collegiate athletics to look at athletes' body composition. It's used in um, wrestling for body um, for body fat comp um, assessment to see how much weight could somebody cut and still be healthy. Um, but the equations that go with the skin fold sums, so basically you measure this in millimeters and you add up all those millimeters and you plug it into an equation that also takes into account age. So it's different depending on how old you are. Um, there are common landmarks, so it's not going to be like some random one that pops up that you can, you know, do the back of their knee and plug it in. There's, there's specific sites that you measure. And your percent body fat will equal the percent at, or the, um, yeah, the percent at site one plus the percent at site two and so on, plus a constant. And that's where those equations come in again. And that's all going to be in your book um, for lab on Friday. This ends up being plus or minus about 3 to 5% versus DEXA or the hydrostatic weighing. So that means that if you have your body composition assessed pre-post, to actually say that you definitely have a different body composition than you did before, you'd need to have uh, a change of either plus or minus 3 to 5%. But really... Uh, let's say that it's plus or minus 3%, really you need to have a change of 6%. So, because if it's plus or minus 3, that means that if you measure my body composition on one day and it's 20%, it could be anywhere from 17 to 23%. So if then, you know, post-assessment you measure it and it's uh, 18%, then now it still could be anywhere from 15% to 21%. So I may or may not have changed because that margin of error is there. That's skin fold. Girth measurements, they are somewhat similar to the um, skin fold where you have site specific measurements. It still predicts percentage of body fat. Um, and I, I'm sorry, I meant to mention with skin folds, you're still looking at a two compartment model. So it's either fat or not fat. You get fat free mass and fat mass at the end of this equation. Girth measure, same thing, still a two compartment model. Um, what you get from girth measurements is you can look at the pattern of body fat distribution. Um, and there are some other equations that you can use other than just looking at total body fat. You can look at where is somebody's fat deposits um, centered around or where is most fat being stored, uh, and that tells us something about their their health as well. There, there are equations in your book for this to determine your percent body fat. The waist-to-hip ratio is starting to become more popular, I think, than BMI because uh, it really doesn't matter if you're muscular or if you are um, overweight, it's going to tell you two different things if you are one versus the other. Um, you measure the waist at its narrowest point and you measure the hips at its widest point. 
and you take the ratio of the waist to the hips. Basically, you want the waist to be smaller than the hips. So if you look at this here, if you are a pear shape, meaning that your waist is narrower than your hips, then you uh, do not have that um, dangerous fat pattern where you have intra-abdominal fat and a bunch of fat centered around the midsection. Uh, it's more likely to, um, to have implications for cardiovascular disease and the metabolic syndrome. Um, that's what you see in an apple-shaped person whose waist is larger than their hips or the same size as their hips. That's the waist-hip ratio. It's not trying to predict body composition. It's looking at fat patterning. And we want to know, is the fat being deposited intra-abdominally where it's really dangerous? Or is it around the hips and thighs where it's not as detrimental to health? The waist to height ratio is one that I like, um, but I want to point out here that the definition of waist and hip can often be um, debated hotly among researchers. I have been a part of these discussions before. So, um, and I'm sorry, I just tapped the microphone. Um, if you look at where they say the waist is here, that's not her narrowest point, nor is that his narrowest point, where, where the waist to hip, this says measure waist at the narrowest point. Sometimes it's measure at the narrowest point. Sometimes it's measure at the navel. Sometimes it's measure um, one inch or two inches below the navel. Um, that's up for debate. And when it comes to how tight to pull the tape measurer, um, there are tape measures that have a little spring at the end of them and there's a little red ball or a little colored ball attached to it. And you pull only tight enough to be able to see the, the ball in the window. So that's one way that we've standardized it somewhat. But um, you can uh, have some discrepancies here in, in measurement of girth um, when it's not determined where exactly that girth should be taken. So waist to height, uh, this is a very, um, a very blunt statement. If your waist measures more than half your height, you are too fat and have an increased risk of living a shorter life. Uh, it's not telling a lie. Uh, it is telling the truth. Um, they just put it somewhat bluntly uh, in this uh, in this image, and that's the waist to height ratio. So you have waist to hip, and waist to height. Waist to hip cares about fat patterning. Waist to height uh, is still looking at fat patterning. Where if your waist is too big around, that means you have that intra-abdominal fat, uh, that more dangerous fat pattern. Right. BIA or bioelectrical impedance analysis. You're gonna, um, we're gonna have something like this in lab. Um, so there's, you can either have a handheld, a foot or lower body analysis, or a whole body analysis. So basically, what happens is you hold on to these electrodes, or you stand on these electrodes, or you stand on these electrodes and hold these electrodes, and it passes an alternating current through you. And it measures the amount of resistance to that flow. So fat-free mass has a lower resistance to flow than fat mass. So still looking at two-compartment model here, fat versus not fat, um, and gives you an estimated percentage of body fat just by pressing go and holding on to the electrodes. Um, this has a um, error ratio of plus or minus 5% at least. Um, if you're only using the upper body or lower body, it can be even higher than that. Because if you're doing the upper body, think about how electrical current flows. It's going to flow across the shortest distance. So if you're holding it with your right hand and your left hand, the current's going to go up your left arm, across your chest, and down your right arm and be done. Same thing with your feet. It's going to go up your left leg, across your hips, and down your right leg. The whole body one is potentially somewhat more accurate because it's going to get both the legs and the arms. But with this, you're really only measuring body composition of the upper body versus body composition of the lower body. And a lot of people, if you look at them and how they carry their fat, that's going to give you two very different numbers. Um, the other issue is you need to standardize the electrode placement, their body positions, how are they standing, how hydrated are you? Because remember, water is going to be a fat-free mass. 
um, the osmolality of your plasma that goes along with hydration, um, and whether or not you've had food or drink lately, because uh, that can alter the results because it alters the flow of the electrical current. Um, this is not typically used in research. It's um, you know good enough for a consumer model, but you'd have to have at least a 10% change or greater in your body composition to really call that a true difference um, because that's still within the margin of error. Uh, so this is available, but it's not, um, not the best method. Near infrared, um, I don't know why I'm hating on near infrared, but their margin of error is up to 6%. So now you have to have at least a 12% change in your body composition measurement to say that that's a real change. Um, what that's going to do is it's usually here at the bicep that you put this little transducer over the top of the arm and it measures what's the estimated distance between your skin and your muscle and it uses that as measure of subcutaneous fat, plugs it into an equation and gives you your output. But same thing as with the bioelectrical impedance analysis, sorry I keep tapping the microphone, um, if you carry your fat in a different spot than what's being measured, then, or if you carry your, your fat in the spot that's being measured but not in another part, um, you're going to get an inaccurate reading. CT scans and MRIs, um, this is not something that's going to be used in you know, a PT clinic or a fitness club or consumer, but um, you can take these serial, um, meaning serial with an S like the podcast, not serial like you eat for breakfast, um, images and they look at, so this is basically a cross section of somebody's two thighs and they are looking at this right thigh here and it outlines which of that is muscle, which of that is bone, and which of that is fat. So here you can see bone, muscle, fat, then you may also be able to assume that inside the bone is fat because that's bone marrow. So it's usually a fattier um, tissue that's contained inside the bone. Um, and basically through these assessments, they can um, predict the percentage of body fat um, by looking at, say, a leg, an arm, and the abdomen. And that's with a CT or an MRI. Uh, with CT, I forgot to mention that um, this is particularly useful for measuring intra-abdominal fat. Um, so if you think of this, uh, think if this was going through, right through somebody's waist, you would be able to see is their abdominal cavity full of fat? Is it full of all this white stuff? Or is it just nice and filled with organs and intestines and all nice gray stuff? DEXA scan, uh, you may have heard of DEXA um, for bone mineral density. Yes, that is true. It can do more than just bone mineral density though. You can look at anything density and by doing so, you can figure out what is fat, what is bone, and what is muscle. So this is going to let you have the three compartment model. Only thing you don't know with DEXA is total body water. Uh, so looking back at here, you have the um, a three compartment model of bone, fat, and, and muscle. Here you can also have bone, fat, and muscle. Same three compartment model, just two different measures. Um, this is really what it looks like. This is the unit that we had um, where I was at last, and basically she's supposed to be three feet away from this thing, but it's hooked up to a computer. The person is put in a specific um, spot, they have to be inside these white lines, and there's essentially x-rays coming up through this um, thing down here. It's being captured by the arm up here, and this is going to incrementally move down her body until it has scanned all of her. And it comes out looking like this. This, this is not that person. This is a different person, obviously. So, the images you can get, you can get this image on the right. Uh, this is kind of what pops up as the scan is going. It shows you 
what has been scanned. Um, this is on the bariatric scanner, so you can actually see all the person. Um, the scanner itself is actually somewhat small um, width-wise in the area that it can capture. So with larger people, you have to shift them to one side, measure half of them, and um, then once you've measured half of them, you multi basically multiply that, and you call that their um, total measurement. But um, anyway, you get this total like tissue measurement. You can kind of see it's cool. And you can see the lungs and the heart is tucked in there. Um, then you can do by density, you have blue is the bone, red is the muscle, and yellow is fat. Um, and you can also zoom in on the bone. Um, this here did a special um, look at the lumbar spine. If you're looking at um, the um, bone, more specifically a bone density, you're usually interested in the femoral neck, the lumbar spine. So what this does, all of these lines basically are movable. Once the scan is done, you move them around to say, here's right between the legs, here is a hip, here's a hip. These are running along the spine. This is the bottom of the head. These are going through their armpits and down to their hips. And then the computer does it, its magic and spits it out. One thing they did not do in the scan that they should have is that um, these are the woman's underwires in her bra. They're being counted as bone here. That's why they're blue. So you can actually go through and mark out things that are not actually bone so it doesn't inflate their fat-free mass. Um, I had to do that a lot with our people with spinal cord injuries because they often have a lot of metal in their spine. Um, so that's the DEXA scan. It is um, considered an excellent measure of body composition and you can definitely look at fat patterning. This is one that um, people like to look at when we talk about BMI and we talk about somebody who is technically overweight, but um, they're not actually a, an unhealthy person. So all of these people have the same body mass index. They're all 35.6 kilograms per meter squared. So they're um, into the morbid obesity category. This gentleman obviously does, I'm sorry, I'm going to assume this is a gentleman um, based on the narrowness of the pelvis um, and the muscularity. But this person is obviously has a lot of the red, which is muscle, very little yellow, a little bit around the hips and the waist, um, and some subcutaneous fat on the upper body. And you can see even the muscles in the feet. Um, this person is is not unhealthy. They just have a lot of muscle. This person has some muscle and a little bit more fat. This person has little muscle and a lot of fat. And I'd say that this person and that person are kind of similar, though this person may be older given how the fat patterning is looking up at the top, kind of squishy and more wrinkled. So this is what we like to look at uh, when we talk about you know, what is body comp what does BMI really tell us? It depends. So this person's actual body composition is about 15%. This guy here, where this person with the same BMI, her actual, or I'm sorry, again, don't know that that's a woman. Um, actual body composition is almost 42% body fat. So you can have a big difference. Uh, DEXA comes in pretty handy with this. It's also easy to administer. All the person has to do is lay there and try not to move. For changes over time, because we're always talking about a margin of error with um, body composition, uh, it's nice to have DEXA as a, like a serial scanning type of thing. Again, serial like the podcast, not like you eat for breakfast. And so here's, let's say this is April of 2009, so maybe they started a training program then. And you can see kind of their fat distribution around their waist, see how large or not large their muscles are. Then this is May. This, I'm not sure if this has decreased very much, um, but maybe the amount of muscle in the thighs has changed. Um, now you're into June. This definitely seems smaller than it was before. There's definitely less around the thighs. And then July, you can actually see you know, the just a little squish of fat there versus a much larger squish of fat 
in the April measurement. So it's nice to have DEXA as a serial measurement and you can show people how they're improving even if you don't give them the exact number. Fat pattern distribution is important. That's one of the things that DEXA can show you. So what you should see is that the lower arms have the least. So if you think about that, um, you know, your hands and your fingers and your, your lower arms don't have a lot of subcutaneous fat. Then your upper arms, that's where um, we sometimes get that nice um, flabby little chicken wing um, over the tricep. Um, your calves, I was kind of surprised to see that you'd store some um, that much more. I would have thought that calves and upper arms would be flopped, but um, apparently there's some intramuscular fat there because that's a pretty meaty muscle group. Your upper trunk, um, so that's about from your waist up. Your thighs store the next most, and your lower trunk, so that's going to be from your waist to your thighs, so kind of right around your hind end. Uh, is where you store the most fat. So that's the typical fat pattern distribution. And that's pretty easy to see in here. Um, and I suppose if you look at some of these, yes, the arms don't have very much. This has the neck, this, the upper arm and maybe the calf are somewhat more equal. But when you start to look at somebody who's really obese, um, even if you look like at this picture, you can see there's a lot more fat in the forearm uh, where there's not typically a fat distribute fat um, deposits that really shows that the body's just trying to find anywhere to deposit all this extra energy and that's why if you are working with somebody who is very overweight um, you'll see that kind of their fingers are puffy their, their wrists and their forearms look puffy that's because they're accumulating fat there This norms chart, these are general trends. There has not been a systematic evaluation to determine what the cut points are. So like BMI, we have cut points to say whether you're underweight, normal weight, or obese, um, or morbidly obese. Um, we don't have cut points here. We just have the averages. Um, these will likely get redone um, sooner than later because um, people are changing so quickly. But so here's, we're all going to fall into this 20 to 29 years old category. Um, I would shy away from calling this excellent above average, average, below average, and poor. I would say this is um, you know, more towards, this is the lowest percentile of body fat and this is the highest percentile of body fat. Because um, even the the very lowest percentiles, um, you are in. You can be getting into trouble with being too lean and having problems there. So basically, the older you get, the higher your body composition, the higher your body fat percentage, um, and the higher your body composition, um, the more likely it is that you'll have adverse health effects. So we're all going to look at this category, um, whether you're a man or a woman. And you'll actually be able to do some of those comparisons in lab on Friday. I want to go over some terms really quickly. Um, and now that I'm finishing up this lecture, I'm wishing I had talked about these first. But the terms overweight, overfat, and obese. When we talk about somebody who is overweight, that means that their body weight exceeds the average for their stature. Perhaps their age is also taken into account, and this is usually by some standard deviation or percentage. So if somebody's so many percent um, over the average weight for their height, then they are overweight. Um, this is frequently accompanied by an increase in body fat, but not always. So this guy is overweight, um, so is this guy. Total body weight. Uh, is greater than average for their height. So overweight does not mean the same thing as over fat. Over fat is when body fat exceeds an age or gender appropriate average by a given amount. So body fat exceeds an age or gender appropriate average by a set amount. 
So that means you have actually measured body composition. You have an idea of their fat amount of fat mass uh, and um, that is greater than average. So here's 30 is our usual cut point um, on BMI. So the person might look more like um, one of these last two people. They would actually be over fat. And then obese, obesity itself is an over fat condition that accompanies a constellation of comorbidities. An over fat condition that accompanies a constellation of comorbidities. From the BMI scale, if you're overweight, your BMI is 25 to 29. For obesity, it is 30 or higher. That's BMI in the terms overweight, over fat, and obese. You can also have somebody who is over fat, but not overweight. So let's say that it's maybe these uh, 25 BMI folks, they are not overweight. Um, no, they're not over, uh, 24.9 is the cutoff. So they're on the high end of um, normal. And you don't know if underneath their skin they look more like this or if they're more fat. If they're actually more fat, then they may be normal weight but over fat, so have very little muscle. Like if you look back at some of these DEXA scans, um, you can see like this person has very little muscle to go along with their fat. Um, if they were to put on some, even this person um, with a lower percentage of body fat has more muscle than them, they also appear to have less fat, um, though a much different fat patterning. They have a lot more abdominal, intra-abdominal fat versus this person has, has more of that pear-shaped, the um, hip and thigh fat, which is less dangerous. Um, so anyway, long story short, you can have somebody who is normal weight but over fat because they um, do not have a lot of muscle mass. The obesity syndrome itself, this isn't news to you guys, but we talked about glucose intolerance, meaning their resting glucose is too high, insulin resistance, same uh, concept, dyslipidemia, that's here, cholesterol, type 2 diabetes is going to go with the first two, high blood pressure, this elevated plasma leptin, we talked about that, it goes along with this visceral adipose tissue accumulation, because remember leptin is an adipokine a hormone that gets released from the adipose tissue, that circulating leptin, um, basically why is that a bad thing? It kind of is like insulin where you have so much of it circulating that you don't, you're not sensitive to it anymore. So if you're not sensitive to the hormone that tells you you're not hungry, then you're not able to detect that you're not hungry. You're not able to detect satiety. Um, leptin is also associated with the onset of puberty. So um, over fatness as a um, adolescent can speed the onset of puberty. Um, and again, increased heart disease and cancer risk, these likely go along with um, what we talked about with that chronic systemic inflammation. So that IL-6 output um, from the visceral or from the adipose tissue and the um, TNF alpha. Um, circulating TNF alpha in the system causes that chronic systemic inflammation that's damaging um, to your arteries and such. And remember that um, high circulating glucose, glucose is toxic to um, more than just your nerves, it's toxic to your nerves, to your retinas, it can damage your arteries. Um, so sugar is a toxin. Um, their glucose is a toxin in your body when it's not um, just being taken up for energy use. So that's the actual obesity syndrome. So when we talked about you know, what is obesity, it's an overfat condition that accompanies a constellation of comorbidities. So here's those comorbidities that go with obesity. So yes, we have a cut point to say when somebody stops being overweight and starts being obese, but truly the definition is that overfat, they exceed a, an age or gender appropriate average. Obesity, they're over fat, and they have this constellation of 
symptoms. Um, this is interesting because if you look at women of African or Caribbean descent, they can have a higher percentage of body fat before some of these obesity syndrome symptoms um, begin, meaning that they can be uh, a little bit fatter but still healthy than um, women of European or Asian descent, so white people or Asian people. All right, that is all I have to talk about. Um, please let me know if you have questions. Um, I would be happy to answer them. Again, I apologize for the inconvenience, and I hope that you guys have a great day, and I will look forward to seeing you on Monday. All right, take care. Bye-bye.